episodes, I stated in the intro, a colourful story involving dinosaurs, Finnish metalheads, a wrestler and a lawsuit. I wasn't kidding about any of it. I've talked about the lawsuit in my last video, now it's time to talk about the wrestler. Michael Magellati, originally from Timmins, Ontario, Canada, is a professional wrestler, actor, voice actor, graphic artist, singer with multiple bands and voice coach for other bands such as Lordy. Yes, that Lordy. It is quite the varied and multi-talented resume, not to mention the huge number of wrestling championship belts he's won and maintained over the years. Michael is the guy who designed and drew the album codes for Heavy Saurus, specifically Yura Heavy Kuninkat, Humiliskin Ur, Ra, Rahalista Yola, Kaudanin Lohikam and Avoitus, and V. Rhea Valenkumus. He also designed the band members themselves, forging a look for the band that we know today. I reached out to Michael and he very kindly replied and I got the chance to speak with him. Admittedly, we don't talk about Heavy Saurus that much, however, we got to speak about his career, his book and what he's done and he's going to do and I found that very interesting, so here is the entirety of our conversation. So there we go. So again, thank you very much for spending some of your time to you know, to talk with me about my, my silly little obsession as I call it. <laughs> um, I suppose that the first thing I should really ask is how on earth did you end up being involved in the creation of the band well the thing is that uh, the original band drummer and founder um the guy who came up with the concept of heavy source in general his name is mirka rantan and he's the original drummer and uh he got a hold of me in 2008 and uh <clears throat> at that point he had he had come up with a concept and he wanted uh like dinosaur characters that would be be, uh, be like suitable or befitting for children. So when, when you do that, you've got to go in this Disney direction, mm -hmm. uh, more or less, and and you've got to tailor to to that audience. But he had another guy. He was one of the most famous uh, digital digital artists here in Finland. His name is Toxic Angel, Janne Pitkanen is his real name, and uh, he does the album covers and the sleeves and whatnot. Draws the the digital artwork for. Bands like uh, Nightwish and Santa Arctica and oh, wow. uh, yeah and whatnot yeah so and he he does a lot of stuff for EMP which is you know one of the biggest uh, online distros for all kinds of metal stuff so anyway um, he he originally drew up or like drafted up these dinosaur characters like lizards basically they weren't quite dinosaurs they're more like lizards <laughs> uh, that that were the um, that were offered to Mirka uh, and and Mirka's just thought that uh, well uh, this is not quite the direction that I that I want to go they they looked like how could I say like 3D animations of uh, salamanders right I get you <laughs> yeah, yeah. so um, at that point Mir or Jan Napitkan uh, Toxic Angel he he he's actually pitched my name to Mirka and said that, uh, well, here's this guy, it's Michael Magellati, and what he does is he draws more like Disney style, cartoon style stuff. So give him a give him a buzz and see what, if he, if he'd be able to come up with something. So Mirka got a hold of me, and uh, yeah, he told me the concept. He needs five dinosaur characters for a children's metal band, and I said, well, what dinosaurs do you want? <laughs> and he said, well, of course, the T-Rex has to be the singer because it's the most famous dinosaur of all. And then I gave him a list on top of that. He didn't have any idea of other dinosaurs that, you know, that, that, that could be befitting for the roles. And what I did was I Googled the different Stegosaurus and Brontosaurus and whatnot. And then I, I said, well, here are like, you know, some of the more typical dinosaurs that are like, they, they, they look different from one another. And different enough that they would you know be able to be distinguishable and uh, I said wh which one do you want to be the the bassist which one do you want to be the drummer which one do you want you know 
and whatnot. Well, he said, well, okay, so you'll choose this one, this type of dinosaur for the, the keyboardist, this type of dinosaur for the, you know, whatever. The guitarist had to be a dragon. So that's the only <laughs> one of them that isn't actually a dinosaur, the dragon. <clears throat> so anyway, that's that's the story of, of uh, how I came up then with the incarnations of the heavy source characters. If you go to my website, which is uh, either starbuck.fi or then Mudgelati, that's my last name, Mudgelati, with an H-T-I at the end, mm -hmm. .com, you can probably find in the art galleries on each uh, of those websites, you can find the very first Mr. Heavy Source draft, and I believe it was used on, in, in the first Heavy Source album, Sleeve, also, for the day <laughs> album. But that was the, that was the original... It, it looks a bit more, <clears throat> I would just say, a bit more <coughs> kid-friendly <coughs> than the uh, than the heavy source characters that came, uh, the the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth albums that I that I drew the, the covers of, uh, simply because I think that uh, I, I somewhat evolved the characters like to be a bit more, how could you say, a bit more grown-up looking, a bit more mm. muscular, a bit more superhero-y in a way. So I gave them a bit more, you know. A bit more beef and uh, some contours, uh, so that they wouldn't look so much like Moomin characters. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So so it, that, yeah. That, that was basically that. Yeah. They because uh, like I said that there's definitely a sort of a, a slight style change between the first album and the second album, and yeah. I, I have seen the uh, the the image that you have on on your website of Herobisaurus. It it is quite sort of different to what they sort of look like later. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, so, you, so you basically created the the look of of the band then, essentially, and they. Yeah, you know, basically, they... I, I say that I'm the graphic father, the the graphic uh, creator of Heavy Source. I'm not. I, don't, I have not caught the, the concept is not mine. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So the concept belongs to Mirko Rantan, and he's the father of that. But uh, the actual incarnations of these characters, that you know, the let there be life, so to speak, mm. uh, those are mine. And uh, so um, I've got you down. You you did six album covers, I believe. I, I did, yeah. I did one Christmas album, then I did uh, the the first five LP covers. Yes, and uh, it, it's um, it's a little bit of a shame because they're they're not. They're, they're, yeah, I haven't seen your art on the more recent ones. It always seems to be those first five. Well, they dropped me. You know, the thing is that I I think that once they went in the direction of that, they wanted to. To cut some costs, and I think that they wanted to also. Uh, <clears throat> they they put out that's the heavy source movie, you know. Mm -hmm. And once they went in that direction, then they started just doing these photo covers of you know the 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 create the the, the uh, characters in costumes. And <clears throat> to be honest, I mean it's uh, I think they look like pretty crappy. Um, the the covers now because the thing is that they. The dynamic is missing, you know. Yes, that that because uh, um, a lot of because uh, I have a lot of friends who are also fans of the band, and they said that the album covers these days aren't as good as they what they used to be because they're, they're so bright and vibrant. Uh, the you know, the ones that you drew up, uh, yeah. and they added a lot of personality to the band. I'm okay with the costumes, but it's like why could you just keep having these lovely drawn album art covers? Because well, that's know, great. The, the only the only thing that I can come up with as a plausible I don't know this for sure, but as a plausible reason is that they wanted to cut costs. Ah, oh, that's an that's an absolute shame. Uh, do you have any particular favorite out of the album covers that you did do? Rav, Rav, yeah, that is my favorite actually. Yeah. I I just love the explosion. It's just you know, it's yeah. it's just dynamic. I, I love it. The um. Because you also did the books, I believe those three books. Yeah, there were three children's books. Yeah, and then there were also like some crafts books that were uh, like, uh, you know, like puzzles and and, and coloring books and what, like, or just coloring, you know, work to do in the books and whatnot. That 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 was that they, those were based on those children's books. Yeah, but there were three of them. Yeah. Uh, so as I said, you're you're a very multi talented guy. You, you've you've starred in a couple movies. You've done many adverts. Yeah. I I lost count trying to track how many wrestling championship belts you won. Uh, I uh, believe it's like over thirty. No, no, it's not that many. It's uh, well, there's some multiple championships of like multiple wins of the same championship. But mm -hmm. uh, just to name them off, I've I've got the um, Japanese Smash Championship. I was the first champion in history for that company. 
And that was really actually remarkable because the thing is that, that out of 30, out of 30, let's say, relevant companies inside of Japan, uh, Smash rose inside of the period of one year wow. to about the sixth largest in the in the entire country. I mean, their their rise was astronomical. So, I mean, during that period, you know, you're you're looking at the guy who was the champion. So, um, <laughs> uh, then there was the WNC, so the Wrestling New Classic Champion Championship belt that was in 2014 in Japan. Um, there was a top catch. European Heavyweight Championship 2011. Uh, then there was the Eurostars European Championship. That was 2006, and another win in 2009. Then the uh, the Finnish FCF Championship that I've get, that I've held four times. I just lost it now this past weekend. Uh, my my fourth title reign of that. Then there was the Pro Wrestling Finlandia Championship, which was preceding that one. That was in uh, 2005. Then I've been uh, Italian, so Italian wrestling superstar, intercontinental champion. I've been in 2005. Uh, I was the IWS. That's the once again the Italian wrestling superstars heavyweight world champion in 2006 to 2008. Then I was the British Wrestling Alliance catchweight champion between 2013 2014. Uh, I was the Valhalla Nordic Wrestling Champion, covering Sweden, Finland, Norway, and Denmark. Um, so out of four, so four countries covered in that title. Uh, I was champion for for uh, almost how much was it? It was it was three days short of an entire year. Wow! <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, and it, that was that. I just lost that this past summer. In, in Stockholm, Sweden, but uh, nonetheless, yeah, I was more or less champion for a year. Um, on top of that, let's see, Ger I'm currently the German DWA, that's the Deutsch Wrestling Alliance, uh, World Heavyweight Champion right now. So, And then I've been a German Tag Team Champion for uh, European Wrestling Promotion. So, yeah, so, you know, there's, there's <laughs> quite a few years in that's, that's and it. And also, uh, from again, what, what, what I've what found out, you, you're a singer in three bands. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I have a southern rock band called Crossfire. That's C R O S S F Y R E. Mm -hmm. uh, we played with ZZ Top, with George Thorogood, with Steppenwolf, with Blackfoot, oh, wow. Molly Hatchet, and whatnot. Johnny Winter. Uh, that, uh, yeah, I've been the singer. I in that since 2010 the band has been around since 1991 they started in florida in the u.s and they migrated at the uh, turn of the century to <laughs> finland um then i've got my own band called stoner kings it's basically heavy rock uh, riff oriented very chunky very 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 masculine very manly um and it's uh, i would say like a cross between let's say classic Aussie era early Black Sabbath and uh, maybe you toss in a bit of Skid Row and uh, then some Monster Magnet. <laughs> so that's, that's basically what that band is like. And we just uh, completed our third album and now I'm just uh, negotiating over one deal, uh, label deal, and I'm just waiting for them to get back to me. But nonetheless, I have an offer from Germany. Let's see what happens with that. Um, then I've got a band called Angel of Sodom. And uh, that's uh, a thrash metal band, a very, like, let's say, 80s, the classic thrash metal sound. <clears throat> so really, really strong riffs, good hooks. Um, and it's like, it's like let's say, a, something akin to Testament meets Exodus meets Creator. Ah. Meets, <laughs> yeah, it's something like, let's say, some, let's, some more recent, like, let's say, Legion of the Damned. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's that's basically that one. So I, I sound very different as the frontman in each of these three bands. I'm a baritone vocalist, which means that I'm not the high and the loud kind like Rob Halford. I'm the <laughs> I'm more so the Billy Idol slash James Hetfield kind of vocalist or Rob Zombie. That's that's my vo vocal range. Yes. It, it, it it did amaze me when I was uh, when I was looking up some of the, some of these tracks like from Crossfire and that. And it's, you do sound different in each one. I was really impressed. <laughs> yeah, I and, often see that. You know, I'm not. I'm not a singer per se. What I am is I'm. A, I'm an interpreter. You know, it's like when I when I when I go on stage and when I sing these songs, what I'm really trying to do is I'm being a storyteller. 
and that's that's really I think the the elusive quality of our true artist our true artist uh, more more so than anything else is is that you can embellish these songs and make them come to come to life in a different kind of way if you can transcribe them with your voice in a way that paints a picture more so for your listening audience and um, I also caught that you you released your autobiography last year uh, back Battleground Valhalla yeah that's my that's my career in pro wrestling and uh, yeah I, I that's actually now sold out <laughs> oh wow <laughs> yeah I think there's like 11 copies left my publisher has 11 physical copies got to do uh, like a second printing now <laughs> that's that's done it's, it's it's gone rather well so um yeah so that that I, I wrote myself no ghostwriter in between I wrote that for five years I started in 2010. Five years, wow. Yeah, I started in 2010 on the road in the Crossfire Tour um, van in, in Germany. I started writing the book, and I finished writing the book in the, in the summer of 2015, the same way I started on the road in the tour van in Germany. Oh, that, that, that's that's fantastic! Because as as I sort of mentioned earlier, you you just seem to do so much in so different, uh, so many different ways. It, I am quite impressed. Is this a, how? Do you fit it all into your day? Well, the thing is that I'm an entrepreneur. You know that I I'm not tied down to a nine to five, eight to four job. And and the thing is that, uh, in so saying, I can I can delegate my time or I can allocate my time uh, in a way that I that I see best fit. And the thing is that if uh, the things that are important to you personally in your life, you will find time for. That's just the way that life is. You know, there's no such thing as I have no time. I mean, that's that's honestly a lot of people they. They say it, but it's it's not true. Um, the things in your life which are absolute musts or things that your heart burns for, that you have a passion for, you will find time to do regardless of your circumstances. Um, and maybe that means that you're going to have to drop some certain other things out of your life which are like time consuming, which aren't producing anything, or then they're just like uh, they're, they're of little like value otherwise to you personally. And, and then you make you make space for the things which are important. So I mean that's that's really what I believe. And um, like I, like I said earlier, I think the thing that drives me, uh, why I hustle so much, is that I I strongly believe, by the way, in Arnold Schwarzenegger's six rules of success. If you haven't seen it, go on YouTube, check it out, and then you'll get a grip, uh, an understanding of what that is. But I really really strongly believe in that. And, and he hits all the main points that you need to be successful and um, and to have a fulfilling life, you know. And the thing is that I think that if you think of life in general, there's all too many people that just, you know, they, they just perform their lives. And, and they're, they're not actually living there. They're basically, they're dead. They don't even know it yet. They're just, they're, they're a corpse. They're a walking corpse. And, and that means that, you know, they hate their lives. They hate their jobs. They, they don't, they're not happy with where they are in life. And they can't seem to, to facilitate or, you know, uh, pull themselves uh, out of the rut to, to make the kinds of decisions that would uh, lead to a gratifying life. And um, me personally, I just, I, I, when I was younger, I made a choice that I thought to myself that, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm here for maybe 80 years and, and time goes by fucking fast. You know, I tell mm. you that much. And you look back, I mean, I'm 45 now. I look back, you know, 10 years ago, that was 2008. And how fast has 2008 to 2018 gone by? Just it's gone, like, yeah. <laughs> it, it, you know, so it's a snap of your fingers. And if you break life down, life breaks down into about seven to nine decades. That's scary. If you really break it, if you if you break it down on that macro level and you, th you put it on paper and think that, okay, I'm going to put like lay out my life in 10-year blocks, in decade blocks, and you think that what am I going to achieve in this life? Like, I remember um, a friend of mine once said that uh, if you look back on your life and you you ask, you know, what have you been doing the most of in the past five years? Like the one thing that you have been engaged in the most of or doing the most of, what is that? You know, right? And you, if you can answer that, you can look at your own life and say, well, what have I been doing? You know, and, and where has my what I, how have I been spending this time in this one and only life? You know, every single day you got 24 hours a day and how have you been spending that time? And you think that you can't get any of those days back. You can't get the last second of your life back, the last hour. You can't get the last day. You can't get nothing. It's, it's like the only thing that you have is right now. Nobody's even guaranteed you tomorrow. 
And if you think of life that seriously, and you think, and, and you, I have no time to waste because I might die tomorrow. The thing is, it, it's snowing, you know, it's getting icy. Who knows? There might be a semi truck tomorrow is going to mow you over in traffic and you will be dead. What will your life have been worth? How satisfied will, would you be with your life if it ended tomorrow? And that's what really drives me personally is my fear of mortality. That, 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 let's say the, uh, the discomfort with knowing that this is just the brevity of a span of time, which is gone all too soon. And, and if you have been gifted by the good Lord above, by with any talent whatsoever, man, you, you are obligated. You're obligated above all to yourself to hustle with those skills, to make the most of it. Because that's what's going to give you a gratifying life, is that if you've got any talents, any skills whatsoever, and you are not utilizing them, and you're not living up to your personal potential as a human being, that is what's going to eat you at the end of the day. When you lay on your deathbed, and you look back and you think to yourself that, like, damn it, I wish I would have done that. I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have, I would have been more brave. I wish I would have had more whatever of this, that. And, but you didn't go for it. Sorry, it's done. It's, it's over. Mm. It's you know you 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 can't get it back. There's no spare players in the game. It's not a video game. So that's what drives me. You know that's that's why I do what I do. That's why I push, I hustle, and I bust my balls because the thing is that I want to I want to feel good when I look at the guy in the mirror. I want I want to feel like my life has been worth something. That that it's I've immersed myself in things that captivate my imagination that make me feel alive. And that's why I do what I do. That's that's amazing you should be a motivational speaker as well because that well, that was really I awesome i just got hired by one of the company or it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's an agency in finland that uh that uh, allocates speakers they sell speakers to like different events and whatnot i just got picked up by them so yeah that's, oh, that's wow. the next no, yeah. <laughs> no, that that no, so that's a really good outlook on life. That that that's that's inspired me actually. So thank you for that. Um, so um, I also um, when I was on your website because I, when I was looking out to, re to reach out to you, I noticed that you've launched uh, Slam Wrestling. Yeah, Slam Wrestling Finland. It's the very first of its kind. Uh, I've been in the wrestling business now now for like a quarter decade. So <laughs> no, no, sorry, quarter century. Quarter century. <laughs> it's only ten years. Uh, so and the thing is that I've seen. All around the world. I mean, by by this point, my my wrestling career. <coughs> sorry, I got a bit of a flu here. It's okay. Yeah, I uh, I can say that that I honestly am the most successful, most accomplished professional wrestler in history out of Northern Europe. I mean, nobody can touch my record. Uh, I'm sure that maybe somebody can still you know break it one day, but to date, nobody can touch my record. And uh, that means that uh, now, at the age of 45, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, how many more active years do I have I still feel pretty good and uh, and I think in like five more years in the ring as, as an active performer and competitor and then I thought to myself that you know like how do I want to facilitate a life for myself for my family from here on forward and, and I thought to myself that either you know I, I go and maybe get another trade ticket and go back to like let's say career college at the age of 45 and uh, venture into new waters somewhere mm. To, to find a you know vocation that would that would be more let's say uh, surefire money and, and uh, income down the line because you know we're just on the the verge of the next huge financial financial recession world where I really think that it's you know it's it's uh, just a second away right now and it's uh, we're teetering right now on the edge and there's so many economists that have said that we're hitting the wall like any second now and it's going to be much worse than the last one I really personally I think that people are going to lose their um, their pensions this, this next fall that comes i think that's what the the, the rug is going to be pulled out from underneath of you know the the populace there yeah but that said how am i going to feed my family from here on forward and i thought to myself well how about i've got two options two ways to go one is that i use the accumulated life experience that i have had till now in the areas where i've been good where where i've done well uh, one of those being pro wrestling, I've, and and I use that as a platform, and I think hard enough to find an angle to turn it into money. And uh, now I think I have a formula for it. I I, uh, I basically there's it's a twofold thing. One of it, uh, part of it is a, a wrestling school, which is not so much engineered to coach up coming or future professional wrestlers. It's more so 
for the general public to uh, raise their level of personal fitness through the advent of pro wrestling. So it's just like, let's say, going to a boxing class where they don't teach you to become a boxer. You just go and you do like shadow boxing or you do like sport boxing, whatever you want to call it. And you work up a good sweat and you feel good about yourself. That's really what it is, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm offering the same thing now. I will be offering this coming year uh, in Helsinki in the capital region of Finland for the first time as the only provider of said service to the Finnish populace and uh, possibly also, Lord willing, I'll be uh, possibly uh, opening up a, a wing of the same service in Tallinn, Estonia, if, if things pan out, uh, as I've been uh, talking now with one of the organizers there. So let's see what happens. But um, so that's that's really how I figure that, you know, that's that's the one part of it of slam wrestling is like the academy part of it, which is this fitness and and uh, and how could you say physical physical wellness and fitness aspect that I'll be offering through the pro wrestling schooling and then there is the other half of it which is the slam wrestling uh, product the sales product which is a show service so basically I'm acting as an agent mm. and as a show provider I'm looking to sell only to sell I'm not looking to promote myself uh, I'm looking to only sell to other companies to businesses offering content that can be custom tailored according to their specifications. So let's say if you have a Mexican theme, let's say it's a, like a salsa theme or like a, I don't know what, let's yeah. say it's just a general whatever. You give me the specifications, you set the budget as the client. And what I do is that I scour the ends of the earth. I go like, I'll find talent for you out of Mexico to coincide with your event. And uh, according to that budget that has been set forth, bring them in produce the show and uh, custom tailor the content and the matches and whatnot to suit the spirit and the angle and the slant of your event. So this is not something that other wrestling organizations or promotions offer. What they do is they have a set, like let's say roster of talent that, mm -hmm. that they have and they're their own boys, their own trainees or whatever it is. And they just, you know, they come in, they do their show and, what they offer is what they offer and that's it cut and dry uh what i do is i offer you what you want to see if you understand right, so yeah words, I, yeah i let you i let you as the customer have an influence and a say in the kinds of wrestlers that you want to see if you want to see a big black guy if you want to see uh let's say a, a, a 200 kilo a kilo behemoth somebody you know <laughs> like, you know just like as, as, as tall as they are wide uh, if you want to see a really attractive female wrestler from Japan or whatever it is, you know, you as the client, you're the one that tells me what you want. And according to those specs, then when you market your event, you have all the tools in hand to market according to your vision of what you hope to achieve through this. That's a really good service. I like that. Uh, yep. I'm I'm not um I'm not in the the region of organizing wrestling events and I only sort of vaguely know from wrestling from when I was younger because uh, what wrestling I remember was the days of Hulk Hogan and that mm -hmm. <laughs> and um I just I just saw then uh, you got trained by Lance Storm yeah I got trained by Lance Storm and also by a guy called Carl Moffat who wrestled under a hockey mask as Jason the Terrible <laughs> for uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of like the from you know Friday the Thirteenth, yeah. But uh, as as uh, you know, a big brutish, uh, almost like a horror, um, intimidating kind of like type of wrestler uh, for Stu Hart Stampede Wrestling out of Western Canada in the eighties, and also for Carlos Colon in Puerto Rico for New Japan Pro Wrestling, All Japan Pro Wrestling. Um, yeah, so he's he was all around the world during his stint, and uh, anyway, so th these two guys they trained me up. Yeah, ninety three. Wow, and is it, you got you got into professional racing ninety four. Well, the thing is, I got in in ninety two actually as a oh. ring announcer. Yeah, I was a ring announcer and TV announcer originally for Rocky Mountain Pro Wrestling out of Calgary, Canada. And then in ninety three, I became friends with uh, some of the wrestlers, Chris Jericho being one of them. And uh, oh wow, <laughs> yeah, Chris actually he he gifted me to set me off in my pro wrestling career a, a pair of his old boots <laughs> for my very first match. He, he just gave them to me, and you know, it's like you know, start me out. And uh, anyway, Lance, uh, yeah, he, uh, we became training partners at the gym for one year. And you know, during one of the training sessions, he took me aside and he said, you know what? 
I see the I see the passion that you have for pro wrestling, and if you want, I will train you. And he never asked for a single penny of my money. You know, he did it oh, out of wow. friendship. Yeah, he did it out of friendship. You know, and, and and the guys that were being trained at the Hart Brothers Wrestling School in Calgary at that time, and Lance was the coach there, uh, one of the coaches anyway. And and uh, he, you know, the, the what they were asking, what I, what I recall was five thousand dollars for the actual uh, wrestling schooling for the for the entire term. And, and I had, you know, I was living hand to mouth every two weeks. I was cashing in my paycheck and the last $5 literally in my account went into the gas tank just to get to work every, like, on a routine basis, every single two weeks, last five, boom. And I was, I was living hand to mouth. I was just barely surviving. I was, you know, earning my stripes, paying my dues and all this shit. But you know, it's like, you know, so I would never have had money to go to wrestling school, to become a wrestler, to get trained. And, and it was by the grace of God Almighty in heaven and, and by, uh, you know, just becoming friends with somebody on the level that you get to know them well enough that they look at you and they say, you know what, you know, I want to help you out. And mm. that's what happened. And also Carl Moffat, same thing. Wednesday nights, he'd take the new guys, the rookies, the guys that needed more experience, and he'd take them into the ring in Calgary on his own time. And, and he would just train you for like two, three hours. He'd be there and just, you know, I mean, you'd be breaking a massive sweat and, and uh, you know, learning the ropes. And and that's really how I got in. I, these two guys under their wing and under their blessing. And, and, and look where it's taken you. It's taken you all over the world pretty much. It, yeah, 21 countries and four oh. continents. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. And all these championships that I've, I've been a main event wrestler pretty damn well pretty damn much everywhere I've been you know it's I, I've been against the top guys in this business uh from Japan all the way to Germany to uh you know all around the world you know it's 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 really funny when you think about it that I and I and people you know sometimes they've they've asked me you know what's what's the catch I mean why you how how come <laughs> you know I, I'm not the biggest you know I, I'm I'm you know 5'11 just a bit under in my you know on my bare feet uh <laughs> Then I'm I'm uh, like 100 kilo. Uh, I'm not on steroids, right? I'm natural, even at 45, still natural. Yeah. And the thing is that I'm not a high flyer. I'm not like one of these really spotty types of show wrestlers. Um, but I'm damn good at what I do. And the thing is that I'm i I've, I've got I've got all the tools and all the elements necessary to make it. And the tools that you need are the look, the charisma. And the actual in-ring aptitude or talent, and the, I, I've been fortunate enough to be blessed with all three of these, and, and I've worked my ass off to to perfect the things that I do well, in in the way that I'm saleable, that I can I can parlay my talent. I can I can definitely I can definitely see all three because I I look through your, your YouTube channel and you got a couple of like promotional videos and you yeah. just exude charisma just at every pore it's it's like yeah you're perfect for yeah, yeah, for yeah. wrestling it's 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 really cool. Well, um, when, I, when, I, when I, was, I have to say about this that it, when when I went to Japan and Japan was my career goal you know like people often say to me like what you never been to WWE I said no. I was offered in, in uh, the early part of the 90s when I got in the business, I was offered uh, to go to WCW and to WWE to be a so-called TV jobber. That's uh -huh. like where you become a squash monkey for, for the big boys on television. They'd kill you inside of a minute, two minutes, whatever it was. So you're like what they call nowadays an enhancement talent. And that was like basically one way to get into, to get like noticed under the radar by the big boys back then. But the thing is that I didn't want to do that because I thought that like uh, relegating myself to that would damage me, damage my my reputation, or like, like at least my my public appeal mm. on independence, because then people would see me getting demolished on television by the big boys, and then I go back to wrestle on the independence, and then I would you know not have credibility, and um, so I didn't go, and I had some heat with like the local other Canadian wrestlers in that area in, in, in Ontario at that time. Uh, for not going, but you know, they thought I had a big head, and I was, thought I was, you know, I was too good to do this shit. But you know, it's just I didn't want to to be seen mm -hmm. in that. Way. So, and the thing is that then I always thought to myself that like WWE was not my career goal for whatever reason. It just wasn't. Uh, maybe in hindsight, I should have. You know, I, I. But it's it's too late to to say that at, at the age of forty five, they're not going to be hiring you as a, like an active wrestler. Uh, so the thing is that my career goal was honestly Japan. I always liked the harder hitting style. I always liked the more serious 
Like you, uh, the thing that I've always prided myself on in my wrestling career is that when you see me in the ring, you don't have to believe in pro wrestling. You can go there and you can say, ah, it's all bullshit. It's just a show and blah, blah, blah. But I'll tell you what, you may not believe in pro wrestling, but you're going to damn well believe in me. So when I get in that ring, I'm going to make you a believer. That's, that's, that's my MO. That's what I, that's how I, that's how I orchestrate my personal piece of business. So that when you come to see me wrestle, it doesn't matter what you think of the other matches on the card, but when you see me wrestle, you will see no bullshit whatsoever. No, I like that. <laughs> yeah. And, and, that, and that, and that, like, uh, how could you say conviction, uh, has been, you know, the, the driving force of my life. So therefore in my career, I've always tried to be as realistic as possible. And, uh, in Japan, that translates really, really well because they have that same kind of uh, outlook, uh, largely and by and large uh, in Japan, death before dishonor. Yes. Uh, therefore, when I went to Japan, 2010, the doors were open, and by the grace of God, I was able to go there. I be I became a star literally overnight uh, for the company that I wrestled for, literally overnight. I took the champ, the Finnish championship back from a Japanese guy who won it from one of my students uh, a couple of months earlier, and I, I beat him in Tokyo, and it was televised, and um, I became a star, a nationwide celebrity overnight. Wow. And the thing is that I asked afterwards, you know, like, because I got so many tours of Japan after that, too, and I was in the mainstream media. I was in Tokyo Sports newspaper. I was in, on Samurai TV and, and whatnot. I was, you know, I was prominently featured as the top gaijin, the top foreign talent for the companies that I worked for. And and uh, I once asked uh, some of the Japanese people, and one of them being my good uh, friend and cardiovascular heart surgeon, uh, Dr. Hiroaki Terasaki, who's very knowledgeable about pro wrestling, and he happens to be one of the medical staff personnel nowadays for New Japan Pro Wrestling, which is the second biggest company in the world. And uh, I asked him at the time that why, like, why do you think that I've become so popular here? Because in, in, in Weekly Pro Wrestling Magazine, which is the only like wrestling magazine in the entire nation of uh, Japan, it comes out once a week. And I in the in the in the year end voter uh, voting the the readership poll, the readers of this magazine nationwide voted me as one of the top five gaijin. Uh, the most popular gaijin in the entire country amongst wow. the nations. I had been there for under six months by that point. They they already voted me into the top five. And I asked, like, what do you think? Why what's the catch? Why do you think that they that they they've taken me so well? They thought for a second and they said, Charisma. <laughs> and so out of all those three, out of skill, look, and charisma, the most important of those is by and far charisma, because without charisma, it's just like Bruce Dickinson with Iron Maiden, man. You can have Blaze Bailey there, and I'll mm -hmm. tell you what, it's not the same as Bruce Dickinson. Oh, no, I, I love Bruce and Iron Maiden, I'll say that. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, it's just one example, but I'm just saying that, that if you think of all of these like successful leading frontmen, just in rock and roll, if you think of, like even in wrestling, Hulk Hogan, mm. The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, you think about Stone Cold Steve Austin, you think of John Cena, and you ask, what is the one thing that all of these guys have in common? First and foremost, first thing comes to your mind, charisma. Charisma. And so the thing is that that's the make it or break it factor that's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. That's what's going to make you into a nationwide name because the, the cream always rises to the top. This is, I really believe this. And no matter what you do in your life, if you are, if you're convicted, uh, if you have conviction yourself, uh, and, and if you really buy your own shit, like in other words, if you buy what you do so well and you can make other people believe also because that, that catches on. It's like it's, it's very addictive. Um, it wears off. So if if that, how could you say that uh, excitement mm. and in, that belief and that faith exudes from you, uh, other people will feel it around you. And man, before long, like attracts like. That's the law of life. It's the law of nature. And uh, value always comes to value. So therefore, water is you know water seeks its own level. And before long, if you have anything of value in you, if if you have honed your skills, the things that are valuable within you. To a, to a notable degree before long uh, people of the same ilk looking for that same talent that appreciate that same talent whatever they will gravitate in your direction um, that's fantastic thank you very much um, I haven't got much else uh, to ask I, I think I've covered 
most of the uh, the topics I want to discuss. And again, I just want to thank you for spending your time today, even though you're not that well, uh, mm-hmm. to chat with me. Uh, just one uh, one little question left about uh, Heavy Source. Do you have a particular favorite uh, character which you drew? I think it's the the lead singer. The lead singer, yeah, Hero Heavy Source. I've been a T Rex guy myself. You know, I like even as a kid, I always loved the T Rex. Godzilla was one of my favorite cartoon characters of all time. Mm-hmm. Um, so really, I mean, I think the T Rex just that of uh, you know classic masculine forte. Of course. I would like to thank Michael for spending his time today to talk with me. I found it a very enlightening and interesting conversation. I know we didn't talk about Heavy Source that much, but honestly, I think talking about his career was far more interesting. So if you're still with me, thank you very much for watching. This is Kraken, signing out. Hello, my name is Kraken. I'm the one who makes the Brief History of Heavy Soros series. I do this series out of love for the band and the music, and it's just a labour of love for me. I put my own money into this, and I put my own time into this. I don't make any money off making these videos. So if you'd like to hear any more about the band Heavysaurus or just want to drop by and say hello uh, you can contact me at, at Heavysaurus Rocks on Twitter and if you'd like to donate anything I have a Kofi which will be listed in the description down below thank you very much for watching